All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to uh, welcome. Let me be the first to welcome you to RailsConf. Um, so our uh, our talk today is Heroku uh, 2014, a year in review. Um, it is going to be a play in six acts, uh, featuring um, Terrence Lee and uh, Richard Schneeman. So, of course, this is a year in review, and Heroku does measure their years by RailsConf. So this is from Portland to Chicago RailsConf year, um, the standard RailsConf year. As, uh, as some of you might know, that we are on the, uh, the Ruby Task Force, and in fact, uh, that makes us Ruby Task Force members. And, of course, this was a big year. We're going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, app performance, some Heroku features, and uh, community features. So, uh, first, up to the stage, I'm going to be introducing uh, the one, the only, Mr. Terrence Lee. You might have recognized him in um, some other roles. Uh, he hails from Austin, Texas, which has undoubtedly the best uh, tacos in the entire world. Uh, so he, them's fighting words, friend. Uh, so that uh, he he's also sometimes known as the chief taco officer, <clears throat> or or the CTO. And something uh, something very interesting about uh, Terrence is recently he was inducted into uh, Ruby Core. So congratulations to uh, to Terrence. All right, so um, without further ado, act one, deploy speed. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so at the beginning of the Rails standard year, we focused a lot on deployment speed. We got a lot of feedback and realized deployment was not as fast as it could be, and we wanted to make it faster. So the first thing we set out to do was to actually do a bunch of measurement and profiling to look at uh, where things were slow and how we could make it better and to kind of gauge um, like the before and after and know when a good point uh, where to kind of stop and move on um, to other things because you can never make you can never you'll never be done with uh, like performance improvements so after about six months of work on this, we managed to cut down the deploy speeds uh, for across the platform for Ruby by 40%. So it's a pretty decent speed improvement. And in order to do this, we mainly looked at three various ways uh, to speed this up. Um, the first thing was running code in parallel. So running more uh, things, running things like more than one thing at one time. Uh, if you cache stuff, you don't have to do it again. And in general, just like cutting out code that doesn't need to be there. Um, so with the parallel code, we worked with the Bundler team on Bundler 1.5. Uh, there was a pull request sent by Cookpad um, that was sent in to add parallel Bundler install for Bundler 1.5. So if you actually aren't using this yet, I would recommend upgrading your Bundler to at least Bundler 1.5. And the bundler added this dash J uh, option, which allows you to specify the number of jobs uh, to run. And this is basically, if you're using MRI, it forks and does a num these number of subprocesses. And if you're on JRuby or Rubinius, it actually just uses threads here. And the benefit of doing this is when you actually do bundle install, the dependencies that get installed get downloaded in parallel, so you're not waiting on network traffic sequentially anymore. And in addition, you're also installing gems in parallel. And this is mostly beneficial, especially when you're running uh, native extensions. So if you have something like Nohugiri that takes a long time, uh, oftentimes you notice you just like hang and wait for it to install, and then it installs the next thing. So this allows you to install that basically in the background and then go and install other gems at the same time. Um, also, in Bundler 1.5, uh, Richard actually added this function that allows people, allows Bundler to auto retry failed commands. So, initially, before this, we would, when we run Bundle install and something would fail because of some odd network timeout, like during one chance, you would have to basically re push again, uh, no matter where you were in the build process. Um, so, by default, now Bundler actually will retry. Uh, clones and uh, gem installs uh, for up to three times by default. Um, so it will continue going during the deploy process. So is anyone here actually uh, familiar with the pigsy command? So just Richard. 
Um, so Pigsies is parallel gzip. And the build and packaging team um, at Heroku worked on this feature, or worked on implementing this at Heroku uh, using the pigsy command. And in order to understand the kind of benefit of using something like this, uh, when you push an app up on Heroku during the compile process, it actually builds uh, these things at Heroku that are called slugs. And um, basically, it's just like a tar of your app directory of everything after the compile phase is run. And originally, we were just using uh, SquashFS initially, and then we moved to kind of just tar files. And we noticed that one of the slowest points in the actual build process was actually just going through and compressing everything in that, that file directory and then pushing it up onto S3 um, after that was done. And so one of the things that we looked into was, is there a way we can make that faster? So if you ever push a Heroku app and then you basically like wait when it says like compressing and then it goes to done, like that's the compressing of the actual slug. And we managed to uh, use slug uh, pigsy to now improve that by a significant amount. I don't remember the actual performance improvement, um, but it was pretty significant. And uh, the only downside was in certain slugs, the slug sizes are a little bit bigger, but uh, the performance trade-off was uh, worth it at that time. Uh, the next thing we started doing was looking into caching. So anyone here using Rails 4? So pretty good amount of the room. Um, so one of the things that uh, we did, which differed from Rails 3, uh, thanks to a bunch of the work that's happened on the Rails core team with this, was that we can now cache assets between deploys. Um, this wasn't possible in Rails 3 because the cache was, you couldn't actually reuse the cache. Um, there was times when the cache would basically be corrupted, and then you would get like assets that wouldn't work between deploys. So the fix there was you actually have to remove the assets between each deploy in some Rails 3 builds, but it wasn't consistent. So sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. And on Heroku, that's not something we can rely on uh, in an automated fashion. But luckily, a lot of that stuff has been fixed for Rails 4. So now we cache assets between deploys in Rails 4. And so if we look at. Um, Rails 3, I guess this got cut off, but um, this is supposed to say uh, about like 32 seconds for a Rails 3 deploy, and then on Rails 4, it got uh, for the average, we, we measure the steps uh, in, the, in the build process, and on Rails 4, the perk 50 was about 14 point something seconds, so a pretty significant speed improvement there, um, both due to the caching and uh, other improvements inside of Rails 4 for the asset pipeline. So the other thing we also looked at was just uh, if there's code that uh, is doing extra work, if we remove that, it will speed up the build process uh, for everyone who's deploying every day. Um, so one of the first things that we did was actually stop downloading Bundler more than once. Uh, so initially, uh, when, you, when we do the Ruby version detection, we actually have to download Bundler and then um, basically run that to get the version of Ruby to install on the application. And then again, we would then in download and install it again because it was run in a separate process um, for the actual like installing of your dependencies. And one of the things we did was to actually just stop doing that, and we would cache the bundler gem so we don't have to download that uh, two or three times during the build process, uh, so cutting network IO and other things. Um, we also started removing, there was like duplicate checks between detection of what kind of app you're using. So in bin detect, uh, we would use it to de figure out what kind of app you have. Like if is it a Ruby app, a Rack app, uh, a Rails 3 app, a Rails 4 app, stuff like that. Um, and then again, uh, since it was a separate process and bin compile, we would have to do it again. Um, so Richard actually did a bunch of work to refactor both detect and release. And so now detect is super simple. It literally just checks if you have the gem file file there. And then all the other work is now deferred to bin compile. So that means we're only doing a bunch of these checks uh, once, like examining your gem file, checking what gems you have. Um, um, so not doing that two or more times. And uh, if you haven't watched this talk, uh, he gave this talk at Agency Ruby. I don't actually know if the videos are quite up yet. but. Uh, Richard does a talk about testing the untestable, so if you're interested in learning how we test the build pack, um, you should go watch this talk. So I'd like to introduce Richard. Um, 
because he's going to present on the next section. Um, so Richard loves Ruby so much that he got married to her. Uh, I think he got married last last year. Right before RailsConf. Yeah, right before last RailsConf. Uh, I remember that. Uh, he's also on the Rails Issues team, and he's one of the top 100 uh, Rails contributors, um, according to the Rails uh, contributor site. And uh, you might also know him for his uh, this gem called Sextant that he released for Rails 3. Um, basically, uh, I remember back in the day developing Rails apps when I want to basically verify routes, I would run the rake routes command. And it would you know boot up the Rails environment. You have to wait a few seconds. And then they would print out all the routes. And then if you wanted to like rerun it using grep, you would keep running it again. Um, so a lot of us, when we're doing development, already have like Rails running in a server uh, where we're testing things and whatnot. Um, so what Sextant does is it allows, uh, it supports basically looking at the routes that are ready in memory and just allowing you to query against them programmatically. And then it has a view for doing this. And this was also just merged into Rails 4. So if you're using Rails 4 higher, you actually don't need the Sextant gem, and it's now built in. Um, Richard and I both live in Austin, and so uh, when people come visit, or actually when I'm in town, which isn't often, uh, we have Ruby meetups at Franklin's Barbecue. So if you guys are ever in town, uh, let us know, and we'd be more than happy to take you to a meetup. All right, so the, uh, for the first part of this, uh, this act, we're going to be talking about app speed. But before we talk about app speed, we're actually going to talk about dimensions. Uh, so the uh, the document dimensions are let me see here we go were originally written in widescreen but the screens here are uh, standard there we go so uh, you're actually going to get to see all of the slides as opposed to just having some of them cut off so okay um, on on app speed uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, is tail latencies is anybody familiar with tail latencies. Okay, the guys in the Heroku t-shirts and uh, somebody else. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is a uh, normalized distribution. Uh, we have on one side the number of requests. Uh, on, the, on the other side, we have the time to respond. So the further out you go, the slower it's gonna be. And um, we, can, we can see this is the distribution of our requests. So over here, super fast, like you love to be that customer, you're super happy. Uh, over here, we have a super slow request and you don't wanna be that customer and you're pretty unhappy. <clears throat> so right in the middle is our average. And I'm sure they talked a ton about um, why the average is really misleading in the uh, in the last session with Skylight IO, uh, but but we're basically saying that roughly 50% of your of your customers, 50% of your traffic is going to get a res response time at this or or lower. Um, so like this is this is pretty decent. We can say like 50% of the people who come to our website get a response before then. Uh, moving up the distribution. Uh, to something like perk 95, we say 95% of everyone who visit, visits our traffic will get a response by now. So I'm going to be using those terms, perk 50, perk 95. That refers to the percentage of uh, requests that come in that we can respond by. Uh, so this is kind of theorized. This is an, an actual um, application. Uh, and one thing that you'll notice is that it's not perfectly normalized. Like it's not like both sides are not symmetrical. We kind of like sh steeply shoot up, and then we have this really really long tail. Um, and and this is kind of the what I'm referring to when I'm saying tail latency. So yes, somebody actually might have gotten a response in zero milliseconds. Uh, you know, I doubt it, but uh, somebody for sure did get a response in 3,000 milliseconds, and that's a really long time to wait for your request to actually come in and, and get finished. So even though somebody is getting really fast responses, and your average isn't bad, your average is under 250 milliseconds, um, one customer might be getting a really slow response and a really fast response, and, and the net is a bad experience. Um, so the net, it, it just... You, <laughs> It's a very inconsistent experience. So whenever we're talking about application speed, we have to consider individual request speed and average, but also uh, consistency. How consistent is each request? Uh, so how do, how do we do this? What, how, can we, how can we help with this? Um, well, one of the things that we launched this year was, uh, was PX Dynos. 
So a PX dyno, a typical dyno only has 512 megabytes of RAM. It's a shared infrastructure. A PX dyno has six gigabytes of RAM and eight CPU cores, which is a little, little nicer, a little better, a little bit more room to play. <clears throat> and, um, and it's also real hardware. So, uh, or it's, it's not on the same shared uh, infrastructure. So you can, you can scale with dynos. You, you can also scale inside of dynos, and that's kind of two, uh, two important parts that we're gonna, gonna have to cover. Um, so of course, whenever you have more requests than you can possibly process, you want to scale up and say, I'm gonna have more dynos. Um, but what happens if, um, uh, if you're not making the best use of everything inside of your dyno? Previously, with 512 megabytes of RAM, you could just you know, throw a couple unicorn workers in there, and you're like, oh, I'm probably using most of this. Like, if you put two unicorn workers in a PX dyno, you're not making the most use of it all. Uh, so recently, I am super in love with uh, with Puma. Um, Evan, this is Evan Phoenix's uh, web server that uh, was originally written at, to kind of showcase Rubinius. Guess what? It's really nice with MRI as well. Um, recently, we've gotten some uh, Puma docs, <clears throat> and uh, so I'm going to talk about Puma for just uh, for just a little bit. Uh, so if you're if you're not familiar, uh, I was totally off on the formatting. Um, so uh, Puma handles uh, requests by running multiple processes or by multiple threads, and it, it can actually run in something called a hybrid mode, um, where each process has multiple threads. We we recommend this, or I recommend this. Like if one of your processes crash, it doesn't crash your entire web server. It's kind of nice. Um, and so the multiple processes is, is something that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, as Rubius, we're familiar with uh, forking processes. We're familiar with Unicorn. Um, but the, the, the multiple threads is a little bit different. Even with MRI, um, even with a, something like a global interpreter lock, you are still doing enough I.O., you're still hitting your database frequently enough, maybe making API calls to like Facebook or GitHub status, being like, hey, are you still up? Um, and, uh, and this will give our threads time to kind of jump around and allow others to do work. So you, you can get quite a bit of extra performance with, there. So we're actually going to be using Puma to scale up inside of our dyno. So once we give you that eight gigs of RAM, we want to make sure that that you can uh, you can you can make the most use out of it. Uh, in general, with Puma, more processes means more RAM, and more threads are going to be more uh, CPU consumption. So you want to um, you want to maximize your processes and maximize your threads, kind of without going over. As soon as you start swapping, as soon as you go over that RAM limit, your app's going to be really slow, and that kind of defeats the po the purpose of trying to add these resources. <clears throat> um, another issue is uh, that I had kind of never heard of until I started looking into all of these multiple um, web servers is uh, slow clients. So if somebody's connecting to your website via like two uh, G over like a Nokia candy bar phone, uploading like photos or something like that, like that is a slow client. And um, if you're using something like Unicorn, it can DDoS your um, your site because each one of those requests take, takes up an entire Unicorn worker, whereas Puma has a um, has a buffer and it, it buffers those requests as uh, similar to the way Nginx does. Um, one other thing to consider with Puma is, so I'm mentioning threads, I'm talking, talking about threads. Ruby, we're not necessarily known as the most thread safe culture, uh, thread safe uh, community. And so a lot of apps just aren't thread safe. And so some you might take a look at Puma and be like, hey, that's not for me. Um, you can always set your maximum threads to one. And then now you're behaving just like Unicorn, except you have the slow client protection. And whenever you get that gem that's bad or you like stop mutating your constants at runtime or something, um, then uh, you can maybe bump up and try multiple threads. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking about consistency and I'm talking a lot about Puma. How does that all kind of boil down and help? Um, so does anybody think that sharing s distributed state across multiple machines is like really fast? Maybe? I, okay, good. Uh, what about sharing state inside of memory on the same machine? Is that faster? Okay, all right, I think we're, we're in, uh, in agreement. So uh, a, a little bit of a point of controversy. Um, you might have heard of the, the Heroku router uh, at some point in time. Um, and this, uh, the router is actually designed, uh, not randomly, but it is, it is designed to use a random algorithm. 
Um, and it basically will try to deliver requests as fast as humanly possible or computerly possible uh, to individual dynos. So it's like it gets the request, it wants to get it to your dyno as fast as it possibly can. Um, and adding any sort of additional overhead of distributed locks or queues um, is going to be slowing that down. Um, once inside of your, in your, your process, Puma or Unicorn has in memory state of all of its own processes and is capable of saying, oh, hey, this process is busy, this process is not busy. I can do uh, really intelligent um, in routing and, and basically for free. Uh, it's really fast. It, it took a little bit of convincing for me. Um, so does anybody else need to be convinced? OK, good, because otherwise I could totally just skip over the next section of slides. <clears throat> uh, so this is, this is a, a graph uh, produced by the fine um, developers over at, uh, at Rap Genius. And on one side, we will actually see a percentage of requests queued. And on the bottom, we are going to be seeing number of dynos. So the goal is actually to minimize request queuing. Like this is, this is time that your customers are waiting that you're not actually doing anything. Uh, you, so you, you want to minimize that queuing with the smallest number of resources, so the smallest number of dynos. <clears throat> uh, this top line we actually have is what we've currently got now, the random routing with a, um, a single threaded server. And like this is pretty bad. It like starts out bad, and it like it doesn't even like trend towards zero. Like this is probably bad. So this is using something like web brick in production. So <clears throat> don't use web brick in production, <laughs> or or like even even thin, um, in single threaded mode. So um, on the on the very bottom, we actually have a like mythological. If if we could do all of that sh distributed shared state without uh, and locks and queues. Uh, without having any kind of overhead, we can see that basically it just drops down to zero at about, you know, in their case, about 75 dynos, and then just, you know, it's straight zero. There's no queuing. And it's great, and this would be amazing if we could have it, um, but unfortunately there is a little bit of overhead. Um, what was really interesting to me is this second one, which is not nearly as nice as that mythological intelligent router, but it's kind of uh, not too far off. <clears throat> this is still our random routing, and uh, and this was actually done with Unicorn and uh, workers uh, set to two. So basically, once we get the, the request to your operating system, it's like one of those two workers is free and can immediately start working on it. Uh, some, some interesting things to note about this is for the non-optimal case, for the we basically don't have enough dynos to handle this, so that might happen if a, you, know, you got on Hacker News or whatever, slash dotted, reddited, um, Snapchatted, secreted, I don't know. Um, and uh, it does actually eventually approach ideal state. So <clears throat> it, it gets even better. Uh, and unfortunately, they kind of stopped at, um, at two processes. But it gets better the more concurrency that you add. So if you have three or four workers, or again, if you're using something like Puma, and each one of those workers is running like four threads, now you have like a massive amount of concurrency that you can deal with all of these requests coming in. Um, so the, 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 if, again, and we're looking for consistency. We want that request to get to our dyno and immediately be able to process it. Um, so you can uh, use Puma or uh, Unicorn to maximize that worker number. Um, and again, distributed, <clears throat> distributed routing is slow. Uh, In-memory routing is relatively quick. Uh, on, uh, again, just in, um, in the whole context of speed, uh, uh, Ruby 2.0 came out, and uh, this was a while ago. It's got uh, GC. It's optimized for copy on write. <clears throat> in in Ruby, uh, extra processes process forks actually become cheaper. So the first process might take 70 megabytes, the second one 20, and 10, and 7, and 6. Uh, so if you get a larger box, you can actually run more processes on them. If you get 8 gigs on one box, you can run more processes than you can if you had 8 gigs across 8 boxes. Um, so again, more processes mean more concurrency, and more concurrency means uh, consistency. Uh, if you are using workers, you can you can also scale out with um, with rescue pool. And uh, if your application's still slow, we rolled out a couple of really neat platform features. One of them is uh, is called HTTP request ID. So as a request comes into our system, um, we will actually give it a UUID, and you can see this in your router log. 
<clears throat> and then we've got documentation on how to configure your Rails app so it will actually pick this up and use that UUID in tagged logs. Uh, so like, how is this useful? So if you are getting like an out of memory error or if your request is taking a really long time and you're like, oh, like that request is timing out and you know, Heroku is returning a response and we don't even know why. Um, now, if the request ID is tagged, you can actually follow along between your two logs and be like, oh, it's hitting that controller action. Maybe I should be sending that email in the background as opposed to having to actually block on it. Uh, so you can trace specific errors. Um, we also uh, launched uh, log runtime metrics a while ago, uh, and this is something that will actually put um, your, your runtime information directly into your logs. You can check it out. Um, Lib Librato will automatically pick it up for you and make you these, these really nice graphs. Uh, and again, if you're doing something like Unicorn or, uh, or Puma, then you want to get as close to your RAM limit without actually going over. Okay, so uh, the, the next act in our, in our play, uh, again, introducing Terrence, is we'll be talking about uh, Ruby on the Heroku stack and in the community. Thank you. Uh, so I know we're at RailsConf, but I've been doing a bunch of work with Ruby, so I wanted to talk about some Ruby stuff. Uh, so who here is actually using Ruby 187? Wow, no one. That's pretty awesome. Oh, wait, one person. You should probably get off of it. Uh, but uh, who's using Ruby 192? A few more people. Um, 193? Good amount of people here. Uh, so I don't know if you guys were following along, but uh, Ruby 187 and 192 got end of life at one point. Um, and then there was a security incident, and uh, Zachary Scott and I have volunteered to maintain security patches till the end of June. So if you are on 187 and 192, I would recommend hopefully getting off uh, sometime soon, unless you don't care about security or want to backport your own patches. Um, and then we recently announced that Ruby 193 is also getting an end of life in February 2015, which is coming up uh, relatively quickly. It's uh, a little less than a year away now at this point. Uh, so please upgrade to at least 200 or later. Um, and uh, during this past Rails standard year, we also moved the default Ruby on Heroku from 192 to 2.0.0. Um, we believe people should be at least using this version of Ruby or higher. Um, and if you don't know yet, you can declare your Ruby version in the gem file um, on Heroku to get that version. Um, and we have also are pretty, pretty serious about supporting the latest versions of Ruby basically the same day that they come out. So we did this for 200, uh, 210, and 211. And in addition, we also try to support any of the preview releases as whenever they get formal releases. So we can, as a community, help um, help find bugs and test things, like put your staging app on newer versions of Ruby. Uh, if you find bugs, then hopefully we can fix them before they actually make it to the final release. Um, and uh, with regards to security patches, if there are any security releases that come out, we make sure to release them uh, that day as well. Uh, we take security pretty seriously. Um, so once a security patch has been released and we've patched those Rubies, uh, you have to push your app again to get that release. Uh, and the reason we, a lot of people ask us like why we don't do that, uh, why we don't just automatically upgrade people's rubies in place. And the reason, it, the reasoning here is that uh, not, there might be a regression in the security patch or maybe the patch level is not actually 100% backwards compatible, there's a bug that slipped through. But you probably want to be there when you're actually deploying your application uh, in case something does go wrong. Um, you probably wouldn't want us to deploy something and then have your site go down and then you're like not at your computer at all. You're at dinner somewhere and it's like super inconvenient to get a page there. So um, we publish all of this information, all of the updates to the platform, but also all of the Ruby updates, including security updates to the Dev Center changelog. So if you don't, uh, this is I think devcenter.heroku.com slash changelog. Uh, and if you don't subscribe to it, I would recommend subscribing to it just to keep up to date with uh, what is happening 
on Heroku for platform changes in addition to updates to Ruby specifically uh, on Heroku. Um, and there isn't too much traffic. Like You won't get like 100 emails a day. So I uh, highly recommend uh, subscribing to this to just keep up to date with things like that here. Um, so the next thing I would like to talk about is uh, Matt's Ruby team. So if you didn't know, uh, back in 2012, we hired three people from Ruby Core. Um, we hired uh, Matt's himself, uh, Koichi, and Nobu. And as I've gone around over the last years talking, interacting with people, I realized a lot of people have no idea who, uh, besides Matt's, who Koichi and Nobu are. So I wanted to take the time to kind of update people on who these people were and kind of what they've actually been, like we've been paying them money and what they've actually been doing to kind of move Ruby forward uh, in a positive direction. So if you run a Git log uh, since 2012, since we've hired them, uh, you can see the number of commits they've made uh, to Ruby itself. So, the, so Nobu here, uh, who we've hired, has basically more commits than like the second guy by many, many commits. Um, and then uh, Koichi is the third highest committer as well. Uh, and you're probably wondering why I have six names here on a list for the top five. Um, and so there's this, so there isn't actually someone on the Ruby core team who has the handle SVN. It's not actually a person. Uh, so I find out uh, the hard way who this person was. Um, so when I made my first patch to Ruby after being on core, I found out that if uh, all the uh, date information is done in JST. And I, of course, did not know that and put like scumbag American dates. And so there's basically this bot that will go through and like fix your commits for you. And like, so he does like another commit and's like, ah, like you actually put the wrong date. Let me fix that for you. So there's like 710 of those commits. I think I did this like a month ago. Um, so this is the number of commits from a month ago. So the first person I like to talk about is Nobuyoshu Nakata, um, also known as Nobu. Um, and he's known, I think, on Ruby Core as the patch monster. Uh, so we'll go into why uh, he's known by this. So what do you think the result of uh, time.now equals empty string? I'm sure you thought it was an infinite loop, right? Um, or uh, using the rational, like, so if you're using the uh, rational number uh, library in standard lib, like, what do you think the result of doing this operation? Segfault. Yeah, so this is a seg fault. <laughs> thank you, thank you for reporting the bug. Uh, so these, uh, so Eric Hodel actually reported the other bug, uh, the time thing, um, and he found this in Ruby Gems, I believe. But these are real issues that are in Ruby itself. And so if you actually run those two things now and you're using later patch levels, you should not see them. But uh, they're real issues, and um, someone has to go and fix all them. And so the person who actually does this is Nobu. And uh, he actually gets paid full time at, to basically do bug fixes for Ruby. So all those 2,700 some commits are bug fixes to Ruby trunk to make Ruby run better. Um, and I thanked him when I was just in Japan last week for all the work he's done. Um, it's pretty incredible. Like, there's so many times when things sec fault and other things, and he's basically made it better. Um, I was at Oedo, and there was actually someone giving a presentation about like 30 tips of like how to use Ruby. And someone was talking about open URI, and there was uh, code on the screen. And he found a bug during like the guy's presentation, and during it, he committed a patch to trunk during that guy's presentation. So he's pretty awesome. Um, he doesn't he doesn't do he hasn't done any talks, but uh, I think people should know about the work he's been doing. Um, so this last bug, actually, that I wanted to talk about that he fixed was, are any of you familiar with the regression from in Ruby 2.1.1 um, with regards to hash? So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that if you use Ruby 2.1.1 on Rails 4.0.3, it just doesn't work. Like, they're, uh, in Rails, uh, we use this. We fetch, uh, in hashes, we use objects as keys. And if you override the hash and equal method, um, when you fetch, like you won't get the right result back. Um, so inside of Rails in 404, they actually had to work around this bug. And uh, Nobu actually was the one who fixed this inside of Ruby itself. 
Um, so these were just like the three most interesting bugs that I found from within the last uh, year or two of stuff he's worked on. But uh, if you look uh, on side Ruby core, you can find like hundreds and hundreds of bugs that he's done within the last year of just like rip seg faults and other things. Um, so he's great to work with. Uh, so the next person I want to talk about is Koichi Sasada. Um, he's also known uh, as Ko Ko One, Koe One, uh, and uh, he doesn't have a nickname in Ruby Core. So me and Richard spent a good amount of our talk preparation trying to come up with a nickname for him. So we came up with the Performance Pro, and this is a picture of him uh, giving a talk in Japanese. Um, so. If you use Ruby 1.9 at all, uh, he worked on YARV, uh, so basically the new uh, VM stuff that made Ruby 1.9, I think it was like 30% faster than 1.8 for like longer running processes. Um, more recently, he's worked on the ArgenGC, um, and this was introduced in Ruby 2.1.1, and it allows faster code execution by having basically uh, shorter GC pauses, so instead of doing full GC every time, like you can have these minor ones. Um, so just he spends all of his time thinking about performance uh, in Ruby, and that's like what he's paid to work on. Uh, so uh, if anyone actually cares about Ruby performance, you should thank this guy for the work he's done. Um, if you've looked at the performance of Ruby since uh, in the last few years, like it's improved a lot, um, a lot due to this guy's work. Uh, and I was just I was talking to him, and he was telling me that he basically like when he was working on ArgenGC, he like he was just like walking around the park, and he had a breakthrough. So he like spends a lot of his time, even off of work hours, just thinking about this stuff. Um, other stuff that he's been working on as well is uh, profiling work. So uh, if you've used any of the Mon stuff for two one one um, with uh, the memory profile and other things, uh, he's been working on with him to introduce hooks into the internal API to make stuff like that work. So we, I think we understand that profiling being able to measure your application for Ruby is super important. Um, so uh, if you have basically comments or uh, suggestions on things that you need or think that you can to improve this thing, like it's worth talking, reaching out and talking to Koichi about this. Um, and some of the stuff he's been working on uh, in this vein has been like the GC tracer gem. Um, so using this to basically get more information about your garbage collector, an allocation tracer gem to see how long live like objects are. And then even in 2.2, uh, we're, as a team we're working on, there's an incremental GC patch. And then also, uh, or he's working on making uh, the GC better with incremental GC. And then there's symbol GC for security things, which would be super good for Rails. So we can't get like DOS because of the symbol table being filled up. Uh, another, so one of the things when I was in Japan, uh, we had a Ruby core meeting and we talked about Ruby releases and uh, releasing Ruby is kind of a slow process. And uh, I, was, I wasn't really sure why it took so long. And so I kind of asked the question and uh, uh, Naruse, who's the release manager um, of 2.1 was telling me that it requires uh, lots of human and machine resources, basically. Ruby has to work on many different uh, configurations, Linux distros, uh, you know, on OS X and other things. And in order to release, like the CI server has to pass, and like you kind of have to pass on like various vendors and whatnot. So like there's a lot of coordination and like checking um, to like make an actual release happen, which is why things don't release super fast. Um, so some of the stuff that Koichi and uh, my team and other people on Ruby Core we're working on is like working on infrastructure and services to help with basically testing Ruby to kind of hopefully automate and like basically do that per either nightly or per commit or something along those lines. So hopefully we can get uh, releases that are faster and out to users sooner. Um, if you have ideas for Ruby 2.2, like I would love to hear them. We have a meeting. Uh, next month in May about uh, what is going to go into Ruby 2.2. So I'd be more than happy to talk to you about uh, ideas that you have uh, that you would like to see there. Um, I'm just going to skip this stuff since I talked about it earlier and we're running short of time. So here's Shanim's to actually talk about Rails. Okay.
Has anybody used Rails? Have we covered that question yet? Okay, welcome to RailsConf. Um, okay, so Rails 4.1 on Heroku. Uh, a lot of things in a very short amount of time. Um, we are secure by default. Have you heard of the secrets.yaml file? Okay, so secrets.yaml file is actually reading out of environment variable by default, which is great. We love environment variables. Separate your config from your uh, source. And um, so whenever you push your app, we're going to set this environment variable to just like literally a random value. And if for some reason you ever need uh, to like change that, you can do so by just setting your um, the con the secret key base environment variable to to whatever you want. Maybe you know like another open SSL bug comes out or something. Um, so another thing that uh, uh, was worked on a bunch is the database URL environment variable. Uh, this is something that we've spent a lot of time uh, looking at, and it's actually support has been in Rails for a surprisingly large amount of time to just read from the environment variable, but never quite worked uh, due to some edge cases and random uh, rate tasks and so on and so forth. Uh, so th this uh, this December around Christmas time uh, spent a lot of time getting that to work. So I'd like to happily announce that uh, Rails 4 uh, 4.1 actually does support um, the database URL environment variable out of the box. Woo! Uh, and so some to describe a little like the behavior is uh, bears uh, going over. Um, if the database URL is present, we're just going to connect to that database. It's that's pretty simple, makes sense. Um, if the database YAML is present, but there's no environment variable, then we're going to use that. That also just kind of makes sense. Um, if both are present, then we're going to merge the values. Makes sense, right? Okay, so we yeah, that sounds crazy. Uh, bear with me, but. Um, a lot of people, you, you want to put your connection information in your database URL environment variable, um, but there's also other values you can use inside of your database YAML file to configure active record itself, not your database. So you can turn off and on prepared statements. You can change your pool size, all this kind of thing. Um, and uh, we wanted to still enable you to be able, able to do this. So, uh, so the, the results are actually merged. And... Um, for, for somebody like Heroku or like if you're using another container, um, we don't have to have as much magic. If you, if you didn't know, uh, database URL, we actually had to over whatever your database URL was, we were just writing a file over top of it. And it's like, forget that, we're going to write a custom file. So people would put stuff in their database URL or their database YAML file and they'd be surprised when it wasn't there or like a different file was there. So we no longer, uh, we no longer have to do that. And Rails plays a little bit nicer with, um, with this uh, containerized uh, style environment. Um, it also means that it, you can actually start putting your uh, active record configuration in that file. Um, another note, if you were manually setting that, uh, your pool size or any of those things via a, after reading an, a article on our dev center, go back and revisit that please before upgrading to Rails 4.1. Um, some of the syntax did change between Rails 4.0 and 4.1. Uh, so if you can't connect to a database, then Maybe just like email Schneems and be like, I hate you. What's the link to that thing? And I'll, I'll help you out. Um, okay. Uh, I think probably actually the last thing that we have time for uh, is uh, asset pipeline. Who, like, if asked in an interview, would say that their favorite thing in the whole world is the Rails asset pipeline? Oh, oh. Just Raphael. We have a bunch of like Rails core here, by the way. So you, sh you should come and thank them afterwards um, for, for other things, not for the asset pipeline. <clears throat> uh, so the asset pipeline is the number one source of, of Ruby support tickets uh, at Heroku. Just people being like, hey, this worked locally and like didn't work in production. And we're like, yeah, that's just how asset pipeline works. <laughs> that's not Heroku. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so Rails 4.1 added, added, added a couple things. Um, it's going to warn you in um, development if you're doing something that's going to break production. Like if you've ever forgotten to add something to your pre-compile list, well now, guess what? You get an error. Um, if you are not properly declaring your asset dependencies, then you're going to get an error. Um, and uh, this is even better, actually, in Rails 4.2. Um, as some of these checks aren't even needed anymore, we can just automatically do them for you. But unfortunately, those have, are not in Rails 4.1 yet. Uh, so in general, I have a, a personal belief that in programming, or really in life, the only thing that should fail silently is this, this joke. <laughs> um, so. Uh, 
thank you all very much uh, for for coming. Um, we uh, we we have a booth and. Um, uh, later on, what what time? Three o'clock. Yeah, yeah, from three to four thirty, we'll actually have a bunch of Rails contributors um, coming to uh, <laughs> to talk about. Um, oh yeah, the slides. Uh, yeah, awesome. yeah. So, yeah, three 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 to four thirty, we'll have community office hours with uh, some nice people from Rails Core uh, and Contrib. Yeah. Uh, so come ask basically any Rails questions or anything you want. Um, and then Schneeman will also be doing a book signing of his Heroku up and running book uh, today and tomorrow at 2.30. So if you want that. Yeah, so get a, get a free book and then come and ask questions and just like hang out. And uh, anytime you stop by the booth, uh, feel free to ask uh, Heroku questions. And thank you all very much for coming.